Cheers everyone, it's Amy Berger from toitnutrition.com bringing you the next video on doing keto without the crazy. And no big secret, today's topic is keto and alcohol. I happen to have myself a very nice Argentine Malbec here, uh, Trapiche, I guess is how you say it, I don't know, Malbec 2018. And this is my trusty glass, might be hard to see on the video, but it's from the winery at Bull Run. Souvenir glass from the winery at Bull Run in Manassas, Virginia. My old stomping grounds. I used to live in uh, the DC area, Northern Virginia for about eight or nine years while I did work for the federal government, totally unrelated to nutrition. Um, but we have them to thank because I was employed while I went to grad school and got my master's in nutrition. So thanks very much, federal government. And um, let's see, let's see. So if you live in Virginia, do check out the winery at Bull Run. Um, right off of 29, I was thinking 95, right off of Highway 29 in Manassas area. Um, I was so fortunate to live in Virginia as long as I did because it's really a premier wine growing region in the US. You know, I know we all hear about California. Maybe you're aware that they grow a lot of wine also, or they produce a lot of wine in Oregon and Washington. Also, New York State, the Finger Lakes. Virginia also, very big viticultural area, lots of great wineries there. Um, if you are so inclined, the I think the winery at Bull Run is just a nice way to spend an afternoon if you're in the area. But let's get on with matters, shall we? Um, can you drink alcohol on a ketogenic diet? Yes, you can, thank goodness. Let's drink to that. All right, now lots to say, obviously. First, allow me to start off by saying, if you are of legal drinking age, wherever it is you live and whatever that age might be, please drink responsibly. Please always make sure that you have a designated driver or that you get home safe in some other way. Clearly, that's the number one message we wanna get out of the way. Now that that is out of the way, can you drink on keto? You sure can, but dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Let's talk about all the issues, cause Lord knows there are some issues. Um, whew. Let's, all right. Let's start with the most important thing. If you are on a ketogenic or even a just low carb diet, alcohol is going to hit you harder and faster than when you were eating a lot of carbs. Um, pace yourself. Pace yourself, go slow, do not drink on an empty stomach. Or if you do, be prepared for the consequences, right? Preferably do that at home or do it when you're sure you have a driver and a driver that you trust um, and, and you know do that safely. But you will become what we call in English a cheap date. You know, it's not going to take a lot of alcohol to get you intoxicated. And some people learn this the hard way. They're not aware and they sort of learn it the first time they go out drinking after adopting a ketogenic diet. So that's really something very important to keep in mind that your body's reaction to alcohol is different when you are full of carbs than when you are not full of carbs. And to be honest, I don't know why. I don't know the mechanism and nobody has been able to explain to me the mechanism. So I don't know if we know why, but that is very much a well-known thing. We just don't know why it happens, but we know it happens. Uh, number two, the number two thing we want to talk about when we're talking about alcohol on keto is that a little sip break. Um, you know, you run the risk of, your inhibitions being lowered and that might lead you to eat foods that you would not normally eat on your low carb or ketogenic diet, right? And it's especially easy to do because where are you gonna be drinking for the most part? Maybe at a restaurant, maybe at a party, at some kind of social event, where there's food, where either, you know, there's there's bread on the table or, you know, you can eat off of your spouse's plate or your boyfriend or girlfriend's plate. Maybe they got some pasta, they got some bread. Um, or at a party where there's hors d'oeuvres all over the place and some of them might be starchy, they might be carby. Um, you know, at a party like that's, it just happens. So that's something to be aware of too, to kind of rein yourself in, sort of have a plan ahead of time, like, I'm just not going to eat X if X is there, no matter how intoxicated I am. But just, <clears throat> again, something to keep in mind, when we are intoxicated, our inhibitions tend to get lower and we do things and eat things that we wouldn't normally do and eat. 
Um, let's see. All right. Number three issue to be aware of. Alcohol is not going to help you at all if you are struggling to lose body fat. If you are already having a difficult time losing body fat, alcohol is not going to help. Um, if you're at your goal weight or you're okay with a slower pace of weight loss, feel free to imbibe, feel free to toss one back, but you know, be prepared for the consequences. Alcohol will absolutely hundred percent always be burned, be oxidized, be metabolized before your body fat. And part of the reason for that is that we cannot store alcohol, right? We have no storage capacity in the body whatsoever for alcohol. We can store protein as amino acids somewhere in the body, te technically that's storage. We can obviously store the heck out of fat all over our bodies and we can store glucose, right? We can, we can park it in the bloodstream if we want. We can park it in the liver. We can park it in the muscles as glycogen. Uh, we have nowhere to park alcohol. So when alcohol comes in, the body must, must metabolize it. So anytime you are consuming alcohol, you are not burning fat. You're just not going to be oxidizing a lot of it. It just doesn't work. Um, so it's <clears throat> definitely not a fat loss tool. However, I will say that, you know, I mentioned on, on some recent videos that I am deliberately making my diet more ketogenic than I've been in a while. And I do enjoy a glass of wine now and then, um, more, more now than then, or more, more often than not. Um, I do enjoy some wine and it does not appear to affect my weight if I account for it somewhere else. So if I eat less fat or less total food, less food energy, I hate the word calorie, but I, I guess we could call it calories. Calories are units of energy, but I prefer the term energy. If I consume less energy from somewhere else in my diet, it makes room for alcohol because alcohol has calories. Alcohol provides energy. I think it's seven, seven calories per gram. So it's, it's higher energy density than carbs and protein, but less than fat. Fat is nine calories a gram. Carbs and protein are four calories a gram. Alcohol, I believe is seven ish. Um, so you can, you can consume alcohol and still lose body fat, but you kind of have to do a delicate dance. You have to account for this energy somewhere else in your diet. You have to take something else out if you're going to add this. Um, let's see. Okay. Number four, as much as I love my wine and I do love my wine, I have no illusions that alcohol is a health food. It's not. Alcohol is not a health food, period. Um, alcohol is quite toxic, quite toxic to the liver, quite toxic to the brain, I think, over time. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that in a minute, but um, there's a lot of mixed research on the health benefits of alcohol, right? There are some pretty solidly established harmful effects um lots of stuff that can happen you know unrelated to acute effects of for example a drunk driving accident or some other like fatal accident because you were intoxicated i'm talking about you know very severe health conditions that they, they don't develop overnight but over time in a chronic very heavy drinker it's not good this is not a health tonic um there is some research suggesting that people that drink, especially red wine, but not just red wine, I've seen it true for beer and other forms of alcohol too, that have um, reduced risk for certain cardiovascular diseases, reduced risk for, I wanna say stroke maybe? It could be increased risk for stroke. Don't quote me on that. It does something to stroke risk. The point is though, a lot of the research I think is confounded by what's called the healthy user bias, right? If there's a lot of press that red wine is really good for you because of the polyphenols and the resveratrol and the antioxidants, then who's going to drink red wine? <clears throat> a, people who can afford it. So people who are of somewhat higher socioeconomic status, um, people that are health conscious, 
people that are probably taking a lot of other deliberate measures in their life to be healthy, like exercising, eating a good diet. Even if we disagree about what a good diet is, they could be doing low carb or keto. They could be doing more of a Western diet, but maybe one that's a lot lower in sugar, you know, one that's at least higher in the healthy fats, the politically correct fats like olive oil and salmon and all that. Um, you know, they might just be more active in general, get more fresh air, get more sunlight. So can we attribute all of that to the wine or to the alcohol? Probably not. Um, you know, it, it's, it's pretty, pretty clear that the, the amounts of things like resveratrol and other polyphenols and tannins and these other compounds in wine, the amount that you would have to ingest to have a pharmacological effect, to have almost like a medicinal effect is astronomical. You would have to drink gallons and gallons and like barrels of wine. You would die from alcohol poisoning before you would get the beneficial health effect. Um, now that's not to say there are, there are supplements of things like resveratrol, you know, where it's more concentrated. They're expensive as hell because I, I guess it's expensive to make. But the point is, if there are benefits, I don't know that we can say for sure it's coming from the alcohol versus alcohol intake being a proxy for an overall healthy life that's focused on health and well-being. Um, because I'll tell you what, if you go into very, very poor areas, very economically disadvantaged areas, there's a lot of alcoholism. Um, and they are not, you know, they don't have the high socioeconomic status and they may um, be, you know, and, and a lot of them have alcohol problems. And so it's not like alcohol is scarce in those places, but they are not healthy. They are not having lower rates of cardiovascular disease and, and you know, improved well-being outcomes and all this. They are sick as hell. Some of them, I mean, not all of them, but but just as a thing, if you if you picture like a very, very, underserved poor type area where there might be a lot of alcoholism those people are not healthy and well so it's probably not the alcohol itself that's beneficial in the other populations it's all of the other behaviors that alcohol intake and especially like a red wine intake is a proxy for um so let's see what else is in my notes okay um I will talk about the kinds of alcohol to drink on keto in a little bit, but let's let's stay on the alcohol stuff for a while. Um, alcohol generally does not interfere with ketosis. I know I said it sort of puts fat burning on hold because the alcohol has to be metabolized first, but it does not usually interfere with ketosis. If anything, in most people, it elevates ketones. And I've seen this in myself. Um, I've mentioned in previous videos, I don't test blood very often, but I test urine pretty often, the urine ketone test strips. And um, when I'm drinking, either like later that evening or especially the next day too, my urine ketone strips will be like super dark, like almost as dark as this glass of wine here, like, like black dark, like it's crazy. So um, an alcohol... Alcohol lowers blood sugar by a couple of different mechanisms too. And this is well known <coughs> to medical professionals because alcoholics, people with alcohol addiction, often have very, very low A1C. They could have a hemoglobin A1C in the fours and they could have a garbage diet. They could be literally half dead, one foot in the grave and their A1C is low. And so a low A1C is not necessarily something to celebrate if it's coming from an alcohol addiction and not from a low carb or ketogenic diet. Um, now, part of it is that it actually interferes with or impairs somehow the hepatic output of glucose. Like the liver, you know, the liver puts out glucose. It breaks down glycogen and that's also where a lot of gluconeogenesis happens. And alcohol seems to like get in the way of that process. And I, I do not understand all the mechanisms. Somebody once explained them to me and it was actually a little over my head. I didn't understand all of it. I will explain it to you as best as I can. Um, I, it, it's obviously something to do with the liver. The liver is the main regulator of blood sugar. Um, so if the liver is sort of busy dealing with all the alcohol, 
some processes might take precedence, some enzymes, some processes get upregulated while others might be inhibited or downregulated. And I'm going to quote from this trusty little morsel of paper that's all highlighted, which is my um, some lecture notes that a professor gave me in 2012 when I was in grad school. This is from Clinical Biochemistry, February 2012. I'm just going to quote right from it and we'll try to make sense of this. Effects of alcohol on major liver biochemical pathways. In the liver, alcohol use causes a decrease in the NAD plus to NADH ratio and an increase in the NAD plus to NADPH ratio. And that's biochem gobbledygook speak for saying that that's going to lower your blood sugar and raise your ketones. Those weird, whatever those compounds are, those ratios are important for determining metabolic outcomes. OAA becomes less available during disrupting the Krebs cycle. OAA is oxaloacetate. It becomes less available disrupting the Krebs cycle. I have a blog post where I have a diagram of this, but here's the deal. We know the Krebs cycle makes ATP, and I'm drawing a circle because it's a cycle. And we have glucose, which gets converted into pyruvate, and pyruvate gets converted into acetyl-CoA. Remember acetyl-CoA? Or that's the glucose pathway to make ATP. Or you have the fat pathway from breaking down fatty acids. We have fatty acids that can also be made into acetyl-CoA. Wherever the acetyl-CoA comes from, whether it's from glucose or from fats, it has to merge with um, with the OAA, with this oxaloacetate, to keep the cycle going. The, the, the uh, acetyl-CoA and the OAA form something called citrate or citric acid, which is why the Krebs cycle is also called the citric acid cycle, right? It's all coming together now. I know you feel like, like brilliant now because you're like learning this. Um, if, if OAA, because this says OAA becomes less available, if there's not as much OAA, this cycle cannot go, right? The acetyl-CoA can't form with the OAA because there's not enough OAA, the cycle can't go. If that cycle is not going or it's going less, it's never gonna shut off, um, then that OAA, I'm sorry, the acetyl-CoA is going to be shunted toward ketogenesis, right? Acetyl-CoA, you know, acetoacetate, acetone, there's a reason those sound the same, that comes from the acetyl-CoA. Instead of going through the Krebs cycle, it gets shunted off to make ketones. So, low NAD plus levels, impede liver beta oxidation of fatty acids, the liver may not be able to keep up with the flood of fatty acids coming to it from the adipose tissue. If the liver cannot keep up with the flood of fatty acids coming to it from the adipose tissue, it's going to turn some of that into ketones. Again, it's going to turn it into ketones. But I will say, it says, impedes liver so it impedes liver oxidation of liver beta oxidation of fatty acids, the liver may not be able to keep up with the flood of fatty acids. That kind of contradicts the not breaking down fat, like alcohol inhibits the fat burning, because it sounds like you are breaking down a lot of fat. Um, you're just, I guess we could say we're not oxidizing it, we're breaking it down. Lipolysis is happening. Lipolysis is the breakdown of the stored fat. What's maybe not happening is the beta oxidation. I don't know. So. So clearly, I don't know everything. I'm just trying to tell you what I do know. Um, less pyruvate is available to the liver for gluconeogenesis. Liver pyruvate gets changed into liver lactate, blah, 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 which increases the risk of fasting hypoglycemia. There's a less pyruvate. And pyruvate is made into, into glucose through gluconeogenesis. It gets re... Well, I said glucose can be made into pyruvate, pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. The pyruvate can also be made back into glucose. That's what gluconeogenesis is in, in one sense. And that is not happening, which increases the risk of hypoglycemia. Less OAA also is available for gluconeogenesis. OAA, that oxaloacetate, is something else that can be made into, glucon into glucose. There's a lot of um, different pathways to gluconeogenesis. Pyruvate is one of them. Um, let's see, obviously OAA is one of them. So if this is not happening and there's a less gluconeogenesis, your blood sugar is going to be lower. Alcohol generally lowers blood sugar and raises the ketones. Um, fatty acids that do undergo beta oxidation in the liver mitochondria generate even more acetyl-CoAs that cannot efficiently go into Krebs because of low NAD plus and unavailable OAA. 
excess acetyl-CoA's are used for ketogenesis. So we have a situation where when you drink alcohol, and I think this happens especially when you are a chronic ingester of alcohol. And I know I don't, I don't even mean like every day having one glass a day. I mean like really heavy drinking, multiple, multiple, you know, con glasses, multiple shots, beers, whatever, every day, um, or at least several days a week. It, it's going to increase your ketones and lower the blood sugar. Um, so let's see what else. So if you're worried about alcohol impairing your actual ketosis, it's probably not going to. Um, I think type one diabetics probably have to be very, very careful when they drink because of the, the changes in the blood sugar. And I, I, I'm not even gonna pretend to hazard a guess as how they have to manage that with their insulin injections. But um, the point is, can you drink alcohol on keto? Yes. Will it interfere with your actual level of ketones? Probably not. It might even raise them, but that's not necessarily a good thing. You might get hypoglycemic and maybe that hypoglycemia is also what leads people to eat more carbs when they drink. I don't know. I don't normally eat more carbs when I drink. I think that's an individual thing, whether you are so uninhibited that you're like, well, yeah, I'll have that pasta. Oh, those breadsticks look good. I think that's just an individual response to how you feel, but, um, and you know, can you consume alcohol and still actually lose body fat? Yes, but it's not easy. You have to account for the energy from the alcohol elsewhere in your diet. You can't just add alcohol to what you're eating and expect to still drop body fat. Now, moving on to the kinds of alcohol. Um, think of beer as liquid bread. I mean, that's what it is, right? It's, it's fermented grain. It's a grain beverage. It's, it's basically wheat in a liquid form. Um, <coughs> so <coughs> regular beer is kind of out. Light beer is okay. There's a lot of light beers, at least in the U S I'm not sure what's available, you know, internationally, but in the U S there are a lot of beers that are like between two and four grams of carbs per 12 ounce bottle, which is not bad. You know, even if you had two or three, if you're really, really ketogenic, that's not that many carbs because throughout the rest of the day, whatever food you ate, your total carb intake's probably really low and you have the wiggle room, for lack of a better phrase, for those carbs from the beer. Um, <coughs> so light beer is okay. Of course, light beer is gross. Light beer tastes awful, so it's not really the best solution, but... Um, most wine is okay, most especially dry wine, red or white. I know people sometimes get afraid of white wine on keto because they just automatically assume it's sweeter. It's really not. It depends on the individual grape, how it was produced, all kinds of different things. So, because there are some red wines that are fairly sweet and there's some white wines that are very dry. Obviously, you want to avoid sweet wines, dessert wines, ice wines, like all those delicious Moscatos and the ice, the ice Rieslings from the Finger Lakes that they make in the cold weather. They're delicious, but they're very, very sweet. Um, so there's a lot of great dry wines. Um, there's probably a lot of apps that you can download that will tell you the residual sugar content of wine. And I'm sure there's more than one. The one that I know of that I've actually used myself is the LCBO app, the Liquor Liquor Control Board of Ontario, because I've, I've been to Canada twice now to speak at keto events, and I was so um, impressed and so jealous that in the liquor stores in Ontario, every single wine on the shelf is labeled with its residual sugar content. And they have this classification system of extra dry, dry, medium, sweet, um, and it was based on the grams of residual sugar and it's grams per liter. And so some of these bottles, the extra dry could have two to four grams per liter. And remember an entire bottle is what? 750 milliliters. So that's, I mean, we're talking two to four grams for a, a whole quantity that's even bigger than this whole bottle. You could drink this whole bottle and not have more than four grams of residual sugar. Um, now you still have to metabolize the alcohol, but in terms of sugar, in terms of carbohydrate, there are a lot of commercially available wines that are very dry, including in the whites. And even, even with rosés, 
And a rosé, you would think it's sweet because it, it just tastes sweet on your palate. The taste of sweet or the sensation of sweet does not necessarily indicate the sweetness of a wine. It does sometimes, right? Like in a port, in those dessert wines I was talking, in the ice wines, but not always. So you really want to look it up if you can. Um, and that LCBO app doesn't have like every wine under the sun, but it has a lot of them. I've been able to find a lot of the ones that I normally drink, and I was pleasantly surprised to see that they were very low in sugar. But the fact is, even if it's not, even if you have a medium type wine, if you're only having one or two glasses, what is your total sugar going to be from that? Five to eight grams maybe from a couple of glasses, if that, because if the whole bottle only has 20, um, so really not that bad. Um, and let's see, beyond the wine and the beer, oh, and I should clarify, one thing that gives me pause about the app is that I don't know who does the testing. I don't know if the Liquor Control Board of Ontario is depending on the producer, on the vintner, on the winery to tell them, oh, we totally tested and it's two grams, wink, wink. Or are they, is the government of Canada doing independent testing themselves? I have no idea. I could probably look it up and find out. I, I haven't looked yet. Um, I'm not that concerned about it, but it does give me a little bit of pause because we don't know where the information is coming from. You know, is it coming from an independent assessor or is it coming from someone who has financial incentive to lead us to believe that it has a lower sugar content i don't know frankly it probably nobody's probably lying because i think low carbon keto is still such a small market that except for places like dry farm wines and there's some other um some other sort of wines that are being marketed as keto wines or low sugar wines except for them I don't think most wineries are concerned about catering to the keto market. Like, oh, we only have three grams of sugar. I don't think they care. But if, you know, supposedly if you want something that you can absolutely trust as being very low residual sugar, you can do dry farm wines. And I've been to um, a couple of events, like keto conferences, where dry farm wines has sponsored. And there's either an open bar, totally free, or there's a cash bar for a reasonable price. And so I'm never going to complain about that. So I, I'm not an affiliate of Dry Farm Wines. I'm not marketing their products, but I would like to thank them for providing all that wine because that's pretty great. Now, moving on, let's talk about distilled spirits. Things like whiskey, rum, vodka, bourbon, rye, whatever, um, gin, whatever you like. Those are actually fine, right? Those are actually zero carbohydrate. They are so incredibly distilled that they're zero carbohydrate. They are not zero calorie. They still have calories from the alcohol, but there's no sugar. There's zero. And it's like really odd, right? Because they're made mostly from grain, right? Well, like vodka's from potatoes. We have tequila. Well, tequila is not a grain. It's from agave, but agave is extremely high in sugar. Um, you know, we have what rum made from sugar cane. We have these distilled spirits made from, from starting materials that are very, very high in starch or sugar, but the ultimate distilled final liquid product is zero carb. So the problem with those sorts of things like vodka, rum, whiskey, bourbon, all that is not the alcohol. It's what we usually mix it with. It's the orange juice and the cranberry juice and the blue curacao, which is like my favorite. I love blue drinks, um, you know, the pineapple juice. And so if you want to do like a rum and diet Coke or, you know, a, a martini or a, like a bourbon and soda type thing, get club soda. Um, I think tonic, tonic water, I think is has some carbs to it, or you can ask for sugar-free tonic. A lot of bars do carry sugar-free tonic water now. Um, but if you can get some kind of, or like drink it on the rocks or something, if you can make your drink sugar-free, then you can drink the alcohol. Again, the problem isn't the alcohol, it's what we usually mix it with. And um, I've said on several videos, I'm not a purist, so um, I, I'm okay with sugar-free drink mixes, including Crystal Light, which I know has aspartame. You're gonna like, like crucify me or like burn me at the stake or whatever. Uh, but I do drink a Crystal Light every now and then. And when I was in the Air Force, you know, if you're in the military, you kind of have to drink. It's like required in the job description. Um, there was this bar right outside of off at Air Force Base in uh, in Bellevue, Nebraska, where I was stationed for about a year and a half for flight training. 
and um, I went to this bar and I was low carb at the time. I wasn't like super, super keto, but I was low carb, but I wanted to drink with my friends, you know, and I wasn't so into wine then like I am now. Um, but I would order at the bar, I would bring those like crystal light to go packs. They still, they, they existed back then. Um, I'm not that old. I would bring some of those crystal light to go packs and I would order a glass of water and a shot of vodka or rum. I'm kind of a rum girl. And I would just pour the shot into the glass of water, mix in my crystal light. And I would have my own sugar-free cocktail. My friends would call it the burger. <laughs> you know, everybody goes by their last names in the military. Um, and so you could do that. You could do that with like crystal light fruit punch, crystal light orange, grape, whatever. Um, if you don't want to do the aspartame, there's a lot of sugar-free drink mixes on the market now that use stevia or erythritol or monk fruit or, um, I'm trying to think of what else, I guess Splenda, Ace K, Ace Sulfame, Potassium. Um, you might want to, I don't know if you want to take that or not. Uh, but there's a lot of different versions of that stuff available where you can make your own cocktail or if you really want to get fancy go to nettrition.com like nutrition but on the internet nettrition.com and they have some sugar-free mixers i don't remember the brand name i think it's from skinny girl or something skinny girl brand uh, but there's other brands that's not the only brand there's a lot of now like sugar-free mixers but again those will probably have either sucralose or ace k or something in it that might be disagreeable to you um, <clears throat> so there's a lot of different ways to drink on keto. If you want to drink, um, if you don't drink, don't start again, it's not a health tonic, but if you want to keep drinking, you can fit alcohol into your life. I will put in the notes for this video, um, a very good blog post from dietdoctor.com. It's their guide to alcohol on low carbon keto and um, dietdoctor.com is the number one most popular site for low carbon keto in the world. It's based out of Sweden. You all know Dr. And uh, Andreas Ehrenfeldt. He and his team, um, a lot of my, my personal friends do some writing for them. It's, it's a very um, reliable, accurate, science-based, ev evidence-based, real evidence, not crap evidence, like truly evidence-based information. No sensationalism, um, no overselling the science, no overpromising. So I will put that link to dietdoctor.com. And again, I just want to say, you know, as much as I love my wine, I don't drink it because I think it's a health food. I drink it because it adds something positive to my life. I am an extreme introvert, almost to the point of pain. It's so hard for me to make friends. I just, I moved to Durham, North Carolina in November and I'm recording this on March 24th. So it's been a couple of months. And I finally, about a month ago, joined some meetup groups, but I didn't actually go to any meetups until this weekend. It's like excruciating for me to try to meet people when it's very contrived, like, oh, what do you do? Where are you from? It's like a job interview. It's, um, I, I am much more comfortable, much more in my element on stage talking to 400 people about insulin and blood sugar than I am at a dinner party with four strangers or than I am at a meetup with eight people I've never met. So it's really hard for me to meet people. And alcohol to me is liquid courage. Um, for better or worse, rightly or wrongly, when I have alcohol and I'm not... I'm a cheap date, not just because I'm keto. I think I'm like a relatively small person. It doesn't take a lot to, um, I, I wouldn't even say get me buzzed, but not even intoxicated. It doesn't take much to take the edge off. Let's use that phrase, take the edge off. Um, round out the day, round out those sharp edges of your day, smooth the corners. Um, I... It's not easy for me to admit this, but I've said, you know, with the body image video and everything, I'm going to be a little more honest with you about my real life and my real struggles um, in, in my regular videos like this, as well as in dedicated videos to things like food addiction and binge eating and all that stuff. Um, so it's not easy for me to say this, but when I'm drinking, and again, it doesn't take much, it could be half a glass of wine. It's the only time the negative inner monologue ever shuts off even just for a little while it's the only time the negative voices and the horrible thoughts and the the darkness go away um and is that something that shouldn't be that way yeah is that something i should work on yeah 
Am I? Yeah, probably not as hard as I should be, but I am. I shouldn't rely on alcohol to make me comfortable in the universe, to make me comfortable in my own skin, to make me comfortable talking to strangers. Um, and I don't, uh, I'm certainly not addicted to alcohol. I don't think I have any kind of problem with alcohol. Um, but, you know, it's, it helps me. It helps me in social situations. I don't have to drink. I can certainly be in crowds, even crowds of strangers without drinking, but it, it adds something to my life. It adds a little bit of joy, uh, a little bit of calm, a little bit of some degree of enjoyment in certain circumstances that would not otherwise be there. If I ever got to a point where I'm worried about my alcohol consumption, I will address that at that time. But um, for me right now, the alcohol is a net positive. I, again, I don't drink it because it's a health food. I drink it for these other reasons. Um, somebody might drink for other reasons. I don't know. It's none of my business. Like I said, be responsible, drink safely. If you think you do have a problem with alcohol, you know where to go. There's a lot of groups. There's a lot of support lines you can call. Um, and you know, maybe I'll put some in the show notes just in case, just to be responsible. And, um, I guess that's it. I used to watch, you guys know Eric Repair. He was on like Top Chef or Master Chef, but I was watching him like 15 years ago or a long time ago on some show called Avec Eric, like with Eric. And it was just Eric Repair cooking before he was famous. And I think he would say santé. I don't know what that means in French, but he would say santé. Um, we could say cheers. We could say l'chaim. Um, whatever. Enjoy and enjoy responsibly and safely. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.